Hey, good afternoon. Good to be here. Uh, and it is uh, lovely to see uh, the fantastic, interesting uh, people in uh, Hyperledger Global Forum. And today I'm taking this opportunity to talk about a few use cases and applications that Krupsi has developed for some of our clients globally. And also how our blockchain as a service is uh, powering these use cases both at the time of deployment to managing to scaling. So I have a few use cases and also I'm going to talk about uh, our Krupsi blockchain as a service uh, platform. And uh, probably around it may take about 20 to 22 minutes and towards the end, if there are any questions, I would like to take it up as well. And feel free to uh, just put your questions in the chat box. It will help me to understand what kind of uh, uh, clarifications are needed. So as you know, you know, blockchain has been evolving quite some time, right from 2015, and enterprise-grade blockchains are uh, you know, becoming more uh, mainstream nowadays. Uh, our experience uh, when we started in 2015 uh, blockchain was uh, pretty much uh, an unknown, uh, 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 you know, subject in the technology world when we were talking to enterprises. But in 2016, 2017, we did some very interesting projects. So this one, what we are talking about here, is a uh, liquid asset trading between banks. It's a marketplace uh, providing a lot of trust and also a certain, uh, uh, you know, ability to make the assets available uh, for all the participants to see and then buy and sell. So just to any use case, unless it is backed by a, a significant business case, it's going to be a, you know, a dead uh, use case all of us we have seen. There are many POCs that did not take off because of uh, the underlying business case was not strong enough. In this case, it's about 3.1 trillion market size. So if you see here, there are uh, four major participant groups. There are banks who are selling the assets. There are banks who are buying the assets. There are importers and exporters who are, you know, handling the underlying business transaction. So business, these business transactions, uh, you know, spins off uh, uh, an asset, an instrument that uh, originating bank they're holding, it is called illiquid asset because the life of the asset is, you know, probably around 30 to 120 days. It's not long term, but within that time, the, the bank who you know bought you know uh, originated the asset for liquidity purpose they may have to sell this to another bank who is looking for such assets with uh, high liquidity so now across the globe if you are talking about 3.1 trillion there are millions of transactions happening so it's tough for any banks to understand where these assets are without a proper platform and it is probably either two it was dominated by uh, a lot of uh, in intermediaries. So that's where uh, this uh, 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 trade asset is the company's name on the right hand side top, you will see this is Dubai based bankers. They wanted to put up this pla uh, uh, platform. In 2017, we started right now, there are about 60 plus banks are onboarded and there are transactions happening across and all the banks are comfortable in uh, seeing the benefit accruing to them. And uh, at a peak, we had about 15 nodes uh, deployed across the globe. And now the number of nodes are less at trade assets side, but there are nodes like selling banks and buying banks. They can always opt for a node and connect to the system. So this is one uh, use case that we did in 2017. And then right after that, in 2019, it's 2018, we did the finance against remittance uh, platform. This is again uh, with a very strong uh, business case uh, uh, supporting because if you see typically there are migrant labors from different locations there are, uh, corridors and they work in a normal scenario if you are working in our own country probably we have a choice to go to the bank or formal lending institution to get loan for various things at, the, at home it could be improvement at home or buying assets education multiple things but in this scenario the migrant labor he's he's working in different country so the banks in his native country, it's very difficult for them to understand what is the, his uh, income capability and uh, what is the, his affordability and all those stuff. And uh, at the same time, the local regulation prohibits, the banking regulation prohibits to give money without all this information. So it is uh, supported by United Nations. Uh, there is a startup uh, in, in uh, India 
and Dubai, they wanted to set up this uh, uh, platform facilitating the migrant laborers coming through the forex agencies through whom they are remitting money back to uh, their native country and the lenders in native country connecting them and putting a network so that the, the, the there is a visibility to the migrant laborers uh, ability to pay and also the lenders uh, can extend load to the beneficiaries that is migrant laborers relatives so this one was done in a corridor in a, between uh, Nepal and uh, Dubai and uh, again uh, this is uh, one of the United Nations SDG program about the financial inclusion for uh, the certain people of uh, certain levels of economic levels so this is uh, one project that uh, is a uh, you know we are we are planning to expand this the client is planning to expand this to multiple corridors just before uh, uh, um, pandemic this went live and post pandemic they are going to take it to multiple regions like Africa and uh, other parts of UAE and uh, Middle East connecting to Philippines, India and other countries as well. So this is uh, really solving uh, certain critical problems and uh, uh, we, we, we hope to see this uh, network expanding to multiple X levels in the next couple of years time. And then again, another project this we did in 2017 as well. This is a micro lending project. Micro lending typically, you know, it's not a big size uh, asset because uh, average ticket size could be maybe $1,000 or uh, $1,200 here uh, you know there are multiple participants and uh, the, the time sensitive you know because uh, if you see typical micro lending it takes about uh, 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 two to three weeks uh, but after uh, uh, setting it up or this platform in Hyperledger Fabric now it is taking maybe a couple of days or less than that that means uh, the borrowers when they need the money they were able to get the money and because there is no, they are going through the formal lending or a formal lending institution process, the cost of uh, interest or a cost of finance is extremely low. Again, when you talk about the micro lending, this is for the, uh, this is for people at a economic level where their affordability is very, very less. So that interest component and the time, time component is very, very important. And also now there are multiple participants in the system because this being a micro lending at a rural level, there are agents who interact with uh, these borrowers. And uh, once uh, they interact, they connect to the system, they feed in the information and we use certain uh, external APIs for getting the credit score and background check, everything. Now the information is available in the system for lenders to decide what, uh, how much and uh, you know what interest rate that they have to provide for this loan. And uh, then the borrowers can access the loan immediately. And on top of that, insurance companies comes in and they also make sure that the borrowers at uh, certain uh, you know, rural areas, they, they are enjoying the insurance benefit as well. So this is another use case we did in again 2017. And this one was in 2020. Uh, uh, use case uh, where um, the, the, there is a supply chain platform for mining industry. It is set up by a company called MineHub, and uh, the mining industry is a very, very, you know, unique because it is uh, it is in bulk and uh, it takes a lot of time, and the quality of the, uh, uh, the the output is also a very important factor, and there are certain uh, ethical uh, side of uh, uh, the mining is has to be uh, uh, you know maintained and all these things should be visible to the participant whether it is a bank or an insurance or a or a buyer or a logistic company everybody should know about the all these aspects and the, the supply chain uh, in terms of finance in terms of compliance in terms of for the operational side all these three layers are very 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 critical and uh, Hitherto, they were managing this in a very simple standalone uh, system, but there are a lot of delays and, uh, you know, disputes and, uh, you know, reconciliations and other challenges. So this, we, this went into production in November and a lot of large scale mining companies have already come on board and uh, we are seeing this ecosystem also growing in a, you know, rapidly right after uh, this, uh, um, uh, you know, lockdown is released. We are already seeing a lot of uh, traction to this uh, 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 mine hub uh, ecosystem. So next one is a very recent one. It's in POC stage, pilot stage. Again, the business case is uh, 
very attractive because if you see the education or student loan, that's uh, somewhere, you know, it requires a lot of liquidity because uh, it's, uh, it's just within the hands of few players who are continuously lending to uh, students through universities. And uh, the size of the education loan is kind of a snowballing because uh, there's an uh, average time it takes for a person to complete his education. So throughout the next, you know, for example, five or six years, the loan has to be continuously given to him. So it's snowballing, right? So because of that, the liquidity becomes a big challenge because if there is one institution lender, if he's giving loan, taking this to the secondary market, who's of uh, bigger than the lender or the equal size, it's always tough because they have to, you know, deal with the wholesale uh, uh, the, the, the the size of the loan, but what uh, the the client who's uh, uh, you know a CFO of an university in the in in the US, they wanted to put this because they understood the the the, the liquidity and also the risk related visibility challenges in the student loan portfolio, and then for them just we have uh, deployed the pilot now. They are running the pilot where that thousands of loans are being uh, put into the system. It creates a lot of liquidity. For example, a, a high net worth individual with certain, you know, SEC uh, uh, criteria, they can come and then participate. Now, the the originator need not sell this loan to one single party. They can sell this to probably 30, 40, 50 uh, 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 people who are interested to, uh, uh, you know, come and participate in this system. Now they can, for example, if a, if a lender, if I'm holding a hundred million dollar worth of portfolio, now probably I can sell it to 70 people with, a, you know, uh, average uh, uh, maybe $150,000, you know, or uh, 1.5 million, whatever it comes to. So this way the the, the liquidity becomes, uh, you know, much more than the, the, the current scenario. And also the information relating to the student and uh, their education, and their status is also continuously available in the system. So when these things are available, now probably the risk visibility is very high because it's not like I'm giving the loan, I don't know about the student. Now, all these things are made available in the, in the, in the HLF ecosystem. At the same time, the no compromise relating to the, the data and the confidentiality are also you know, extremely critical. The, the, we, we designed the system in such a way that without compromising uh, the security, without compromising the confidentiality and the data privacy, the lenders and investors, they are able to transact the loans and they can also see the risk uh, coercion of the particular asset. So that's what this uh, education loan uh, project is about. Then comes, uh, you know, all these projects, if you see, you know, it took average about three to maximum four months for us to put a production you know a production grade uh, system uh, in in a fully deployed uh, on in uh, any cloud you know it's a cloud agnostic uh, blockchain as a service platform we have and it's also domain agnostic now you have seen a supply chain and a banking and a micro lending and we have done uh, you know a, a retail uh, application we have done multiple uh, uh, you know applications uh, across multiple domains so Crypto blockchain as a service platform was a backbone and that drives all these uh, uh, programs. So why do we need a blockchain as a service platform in the first place? If you see the blockchain adoption in the initial stages, we are going through a lot of challenges, you know, starting from availability of talent pool, because a person who's coming in and then trying to build a system for, a, for an enterprise, he should know about cryptography, he should know about blockchain, how it is working, he should know the full stack development capabilities, and he should know the you know certain uh, you know legal aspects of it. There are multiple challenges. So it's not easy to get a you know set of talent with all these experiences and uh, capability. And then continues evolving because if you see Hyperledger started from dot six, we are talking about two dot X now. So it's, it's kind of, you know, to that, to that extent, it's dynamic. You know, we are seeing a lot of improvements, a lot of upgrades happening. So that is also certain, you know, the, the technology challenge, because if you are in 1.4, if you have to do, move to 2.2, .2, you need to understand the, the dynamics of uh, the, the, the protocol upgrades and advancement. And then again, the any, you know, most of the projects that we have done, 
it's all connecting to a certain third, another, the, another technology as well. It could be IoT, it could be AI, it could be ML. So it, there are ancillary technologies. Maybe it is development related, or it is also giving some value added services for the use case. So those things are also very, very critical and important. And uh, the conceptual understanding of blockchain by itself is a big challenge because uh, you know there were situations where uh, a blockchain uh, technology was put as a force fit for a use case. You know maybe that's not a uh, the best case because uh, uh, you know ultimately the ROI will go for a task and the enterprises will uh, will look at like okay why am I running this program and the partners are not coming on board. So there are other challenges as well. So the business value has to be clearly identified. Only then conceptually, you know, the, the, the blockchain will make sense for the use case. So that's also another challenge, challenge that the enterprises are, are going through. And then blockchain is not an IT topic for an enterprise. It's a service design. For example, if you're talking about a trace and track program, or if you're talking about a sustainability program, so you have to, you have to talk about the ecosystem and uh, there are certain compliances that you may have to think about. There are certain partner onboarding processes you may have to think about. I think it's not just an IT topic. And taking all these challenges into consideration, we build this blockchain as a service platform, which is almost like, you know, you take HLF, you, you, you decide that this is a use case, you don't have to do anything else. The crypto blockchain as a service platform helps right from deploy, development, deployment, management, and scale all through. It is a uh, UI, uh, UI driven, uh, it's a GUI driven, so you don't have to worry about going to the console and then uh, uh, punching in codes and uh, understanding Golang, understanding uh, Hyperledger uh, smart contract, how it is working, how the crypto side of uh, the identity working, probably all those things are not required. So we have done 50 plus POCs so far in this platform, 10 plus of them are in uh, production grade already. So when you when you see the stack, you know, it is, uh, you know, we, we have created multiple layers starting from the bottom. If you see it's, uh, you know, the smart contract layer where anything relating to the data, I think we are managing in that, uh, that layer, which is a blockchain node and peer layer. And then comes your middleware, a lot of communication related boxes. You are seeing all these things are included in your blockchain as a service platform. And we also have a conceptual data lake because we make sure that the reporting and querying is happening directly from the data lake. We meaningfully take the information from the block into the data lake so that the, the business uh, information that anybody wants to get from the blockchain network, it is easy for them to get from the data lake rather than understand, you know, coming into the block and trying to take the data and uh, you know trying to understand the logic behind the data. That's what the data lake does. And then we have got uh, the deployment side you know, anything relating to any cloud, irrespective of the cloud, we have got all the services that is available, including the health check and network management and your cloud resource management, all the artifacts, whatever is required connecting to the cloud infrastructure is done in our deployment tool. In fact, we have also deployed an ARM template for HLF 2.2 in uh, Azure now, it's uh, free of cost. Any enterprise wants to deploy, they can use that ARM template. And then uh, you, boom, you have the 2.2 within about you know uh, a few clicks. So that's what we have done. And on top is an excellent product, you know, uh, a feature called process modeling. So if you know uh, a four sheet of what exactly your use case, who the participants are, what the data set is, what the business role, probably you can come and just map what you want then your application is ready with certain UI. Uh, it's not a, you know, all that uh, uh, exciting UI, but the very basic UI for you to test the application and then move it iteratively, iteratively to the production grade. Now it generates API, it generates UI, it generates chain code, and also it generates a data lake. Now all these things generated, then you can have a look at your application and then improvise it as you want to move towards production more partners coming in, they may have their own requirements, you can modify it. It's not a, because it's just a, you know, you may have to change the data structure and you may have to change certain rules, whatever you want to change. You don't have to get into deeper coding. It's a low code environment, probably about 95% you don't have to code. Still, you may have to code about four to 5%. It's just a scripting if the business rule is going to be so complicated. We have seen in any use case, the business rule complication 
is by default. So that's why we are saying about four to five percent of coding is essential. So with that process modeling, it is easy for you to, you know, number one, deploy and then do your process modeling. Your application is ready. Now your middleware and other blockchain uh, uh, peer management systems, what you are seeing on the bottom two layers. With that, you'll be able to manage and then scale your application. And you want to scale your application more members coming in, more organization coming in, new channels you want to set up, more peers you want to set up, all those things you can do just through uh, a GUI-driven uh, uh, you know, screens. And we also provide managed services. If an enterprise wants us to take care of the entire services, we will take that responsibility with our own eyeball, monitoring your nodes and uh, whenever whatever services are required on the reactive mode, we will do those things as well. So end-to-end, uh, any life cycle of a Hyperledger program, Cryptcore bus, it does without much need for manual and time consuming effort. And it is since it is time tested, it's, uh, you know, probably uh, the, uh, uh, close to zero uh, error, uh, I would say. So that this is about the Cryptcore stack. When we put that into a customer application, the architecture works on the left hand side is our uh, group core and always there is a question about who wants IP, how it works and all those stuff. We have given a very clear uh, demarcation of what group core on the right hand side, what the box you are talking about is a client application. Tomorrow if they don't want a group core, they want to run their own services, they can take this uh, their, their you know the application and they can take it put it on any bus or any services that they may develop on their this is a kind of a flexible, you know, approach that we have given. I think with that, all these 50 plus projects in, uh, you know, some of them are in production, like 10 plus are in production. And uh, we are also seeing a lot of demand uh, after uh, uh, certain products in the market were taken out and after certain services were taken out. I think there are a lot of demand for uh, the boss services that Cripsy is providing. So that's all I have today. This is... Uh, you know, about Cripsy, we are serial entrepreneurs. We come from a very strong uh, uh, cryptography background. And uh, this is uh, all of us are working together from, uh, you know, from 2006. And from 2006, Cripsy is in existence. Prior to that, we were working in our other startup and, you know, ventures. And we are present across the globe. Our corporate old co is in the US. We have an operating entity in Seattle and in Netherlands, uh, The Hague and in Bangalore. Uh, we have a, a strong uh, team of uh, research and developers uh, sitting in Bangalore. That's uh, our background. My name is uh, I am Ravi Jagannathan. I'm you know I have about 30 plus years of uh, business experience globally. I was in the corporate world and I started my first venture in 2008 that is relating to the trust authority system in India called Yimudra. Then I set up a, a tax filing portal, the first tax filing authority in India, and then we started blockchain in 2016. So feel free, if you have any questions, I'm happy to take the uh, questions. Yeah, there is a question from Karthik. He's asking, uh, this is domain for HLF or for any other protocol. We, the blockchain as a service layer, what we have, it works only for, uh, uh, sorry. It's, it works only for uh, uh, HLF. Uh, we don't support any other protocols, but we work in uh, Hedera protocol as well. That is more to do with the path public. If you have any, uh, a uh, 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 closed loop enterprise system uh, driving a use case in uh, Hyperledger. And if there is a need for ex you know extending this uh, information to a public network, then we have got a pipe to uh, Hedera and uh, Hedera being cost effective and also times in, uh, effective and uh, uh, green efficient, we used uh, Hedera and that information now available through the consensus service of Hedera that's available uh, in a public mode. Hi, Ravi. There's also a question from Yaku. A little bit more about live financial services applications, not a POC, just uh, things that are actually live and happening. 
which uh, which application sorry uh, life financial services life financial, financial services. services yeah i think the the uh, the one uh, uh, i was talking about the bank uh, marketplace where illiquid assets are being traded it's a live it's a production there are 60 plus banks have onboarded what they do is they are there are illiquid assets. For example, if I'm talking about I have lent for my client, it could be a trade finance asset, and this asset I'm holding. And uh, if I want to sell to uh, another bank, now it's very difficult for me to understand which bank is interested, and because it's across the globe. I may be sitting in Bangladesh, uh, Dhaka, and there may be a buying bank sitting in London. If they want to buy, they don't know me, I don't know them. So this is a very typical problem and also even if they know they may not be able to put some trust on me and my asset so what we have is we have this platform set up this platform is a uh, completely smart contract driven and also it is a uh, you know it gives a lot of visibility to the asset and the, now the bank in london they know that there is an asset available and also they know the complete trace and track of the asset because that's how it is captured now they can bid for the asset and then they can buy and everybody knows this asset moves to move to another bank and that bank when they want to sell to another bank for example now the trace and track of the asset is available until the bank who's holding that asset so that is how that was uh, uh, you know architected so that's one live use case it's in production That's great, thank you. We still have two minutes, so uh, I would uh, go through the follow-up questions uh, from uh, Catherick, um, which is, um, what about application upgrades? Say, Hy Hyperledger Fabric moves from 2.x to 3 or 4. Be seamless, uh, or will the application sitting on top be impacted? Yeah, being a member of uh, 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 Hyperledger Fabric and uh, contributors of Hyperledger Fabric, we, we closely work with Hyperledger and community. We understand the future uh, versions and what functions the future which, which, uh, you know, uh, versions are bringing in. For example, 2.2, when it came uh, alongside, within a week from 2.2 announcement, our trip core was ready for 2.2 because we closely work with the Hyperledger community to understand the future versions. And we upgrade our Hyperledger, our trip core uh, boss uh, to make sure that the upgraded versions are available as quick as possible. So we support, we started supporting dot six and we have matured up to 2.x now. So we are already, I think 2.3 dot something. I think that's a version which we are currently supporting. And um, last one last question from Jakub is, what is the pricing model uh, for Cryptsy? Yeah, we have got a couple of, there are three layers. Number one, if you want uh, application development consulting services, that comes at the completely consulting services mode. We have a red card and uh, ours is a time and cost sensitive, a uh, time uh, and uh, uh, effort sensitive. So at a very least possible time, we will be able to give you an application. The second one is you, you have a team of Hyperledger or a blockchain uh, specialist or a technical specialist. You can take hype our uh, boss on a license uh, basis it's a uh, we charge either per transaction or a periodical you know annual license you can take that and then you can run uh, your uh, managed services or if you want us to do the managed services we do end-to-end -end. that is that goes by uh, per node uh, per hour basis and also we have a charges at a subscription they may have to pay for using our blockchain as a service layer this on top of that we add the underlying uh, uh, infrastructure cost directly whatever cloud you want to have it's a back-to-back we'll take that cost and any uh, eyeball is required if you want some support from uh, our uh, technical team that is also uh, will be charged on top of that on an hourly basis or a daily basis wonderful thank you um well i guess uh Jakub, you will have to follow up with ravi um separately because we ran out of time we're actually one minute over so thank you everyone for participating uh go ahead and uh, catch the last session uh of this block uh for and then i'll see you in afternoon
Thank you. Yakub, I we, we support uh, Hedera blockchain that I have already told. Please let us get back, uh, connect back and then see how we can work together. Thank you. Appreciate it. Bye-bye.